So you're back from the fort, from Fort Cumberland. Fort Cumberland. It was really an really interesting location. You touched a little bit about uh, what happened um, during that time period. We're really interested right now in what happens at the end of the Seven Years War leading up to the American Revolution. Right. Can you just tell us again exactly like w what's going on with the okay. population? It, it's, a, it's a messy thing. There's no doubt about it. Um, we talked about this last week with the Acadians and just how messy that story is. This was, I don't think this is that messy, but it, it has some, some problematic elements. The one thing I think most of us need to keep in mind when we think about this story is just that 12 years between the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, between 1763 and 1775, and what's happening there. And in Nova Scotia, what's happening there, we know, we saw this last week, they, they expelled the Acadians from Nova Scotia. So suddenly all that very good farmland, all that diked farmland, I was talking about last week, how magnificent that farm, suddenly that's available. Uh, so they're bringing settlers from New England uh, into Nova Scotia to settle on those former Acadian lands. So in that time period, approximately 10,000 New Englanders make that move into, into modern-day Nova Scotia. So the simple question is, these people are from the heartland of the Revolution. Most of them are from Massachusetts, the center of the Revolution. They grew up in the same neighborhood. They had the same discussions, they, you know, the same political experiences, well, roughly. Um, so why, when they get to Nova Scotia, don't they rebel? Why don't they pick up arms? Why don't they choose to rebel with, with their cousins back in Boston? It's a great question, and it's a pretty clear question um, from the reading you actually say in, in yeah. your introduction. And you offer a lot of answers to the question. Uh, can I, I'm going to quote it here. So you say, Were they, did they not believe in democracy? <laughs> did they not believe in liberty? Were they monarchists? Cowards? Were they wary of the powerful presence of the British military? So those are some answers yeah. that we can look to in um, in the readings. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also there's other answers to it as well. Yeah, and we've been talking about historiography here. We've been talking about, and I think people are always afraid of this word, um, but I'm trying to encourage you to think about it just as a conversation, just historians having a conversation. I study something and I discover this, you study something, you discover you laugh, and we're having a conversation about how we understand that story. And that's kind of what's going on here. So just to give you an obvious example, the, the second last reading here this week is John Reed. Um, he's looking at Mi'kmaq uh, military capacity in northeastern North America in this time period. He did not set out to write an essay about the American Revolution or the Mi'kmaq role in the American Revolution. But in researching that topic, he comes to the conclusion that they had a significant military capacity. And yet they don't fight in the war. And so that's interesting for him, studying that. But it also allows him to think, oh, um, that means they could have played a significant role in the war. We know that the rebels are actively courting them, actively trying to bring them in to support them during the revolution, and yet they choose to remain neutral. One of your primary documents, we're not looking at the primary documents this week, but one of the primary documents is one of those letters where they're requesting Mi'kmaq support and whether Mi'kmaq are de politely declining to offer that support, politely, because uh, they don't want to get into a war. Um, but it allows John Reed to say, this is part of the story of why the Nova Scotian New England settlers, those Nova Scotia Yankees, why they don't rebel. And I love that phrase, the Nova Scotia Yankees, because it does remind us of who they are. Right. They're New Englanders, recently moved into Nova Scotia. So he's suddenly looking at that Mi'kmaq military capacity and saying, there's part of the answer. And he, and he talks about it briefly in his essay, even though it wasn't his main question, but it allows him to participate in the conversation, to participate in the broader conversation about that story. And when you talk about the conversation, so as, as we read the articles, um, obviously the, the historians aim to answer their own particular question, but there's a question that we're seeking. This one is very clear, mm -hmm. obviously, yeah. the question is, why didn't Nova Scotians participate right. in the American Revolution? That's pretty straightforward. You say it in, over and over again. But as we look forward uh, to future weeks reading articles, we're trying to look for some kind of question that unifies these, right. these readings. In fact, I think that's really the key to this, this, this course and this assignment in general. Right. And, and that's really kind of where the idea of the conversation comes in, is most conversations begin with a question. You know, what are you doing tonight? Off, you know, off, off, off it goes into the spinning around what, what, what do you think about Donald Trump's presidency? You know, whatever. God, I hope that's not fortuitous. Oh. Um, and, but that's how a conversation begins, with a question, and you can go to, to the various replies to that. And that's kind of what I want you to look at here. We've got a story. We've got a basic thing happening. We've got a basic topic happening. And we're trying to find ways in the author's perspectives that allow us to find that common question, to step back and say, like John Reed, isn't specifically tackling the question of the, of, of 
Nova Scotian Yankees participation in the American Revolution, but he still gets at it. So we can lump him in with that other conversation. We can say he's contributing to that conversation. So look for where the center of the conversation is and what's the kind of general question that they're asking. And that's a good way to approach this, to think about this. And there's a lot of meat in here to get into. There's yeah. lots of answers to that question that we could... Um, yeah. this, one, this one's got lots of possibilities. And, and that's why you've got five excerpts. You've got five people with really quite different perspectives. Um, and we touched on some of that in our screencasts. And as you pointed out, the introduction touches on some of that as well. Don't think that there's a map there. I'm not just kind of giving it all away there, but giving you a sense that there's different things we can talk about and different ways we can think about getting at the same basic question. Okay, I'm going to do these readings with that in mind. That would be good. <laughs>